Well, hello, everyone. Um, glad some people can join in this evening, work week evening. I'm sure it's really cold in Mongolia. Um, I'm really happy to start the uh, learning session for December at the Mongolian Evaluation Association. My name is Susanna, and I'm currently a Fulbright Scholar in the U.S. Previously, I've worked in the government and development policy planning, and I think I see some colleagues also in the um, participant list, so glad to see everyone. Um, but the main guest today is uh, Dr. Thomas Grayson, but he humbly asked me to refer to him as Tom, so we will refer to him as Tom duration of the uh, session today. Um, just short intro about who Tom is. Tom has decades of experience in education and evaluation. His expertise is really expansive and profound. Um, he has evaluated special educational and social programs, crafted intricate program concepts, and established an evaluation and assessment office at the University of Illinois back in 1999 um, at the Student Affairs Division. And additionally, Tom has offered his guidance to the Illinois State Education Board. Um, notably, as you may know, Tom served as the American Evaluation Association's pet president from 2020 to 2022, uh, which also underscores his commitment and you know, his willingness to give back to the community of evaluators, um, seeing that he's joining and spending his precious time and uh, with us. And um, we're really looking forward to learning from Tom and discussing, um, asking questions about, you know, his thoughts uh, based on his decades of experience. And, you know, um, given that so many emerging trends are happening um, as well in evaluation, we both were at the um, American Evaluation Association's annual conference in Indianapolis uh, about two months ago. So. Hope to hear some insights from Tom on that as well. So without further ado, I will welcome Tom. Um, Tom, please take the stage and start with um, your presentation and then we'll go into um, the, um, the rest of the program. But before we go into your lecture, um, Tom, I'm just gonna, uh, I wanna make sure that we have some housekeeping rules um, set up. So. Our agenda today goes on as uh, Tom presenting his presentation, and then we will have a quick observation or Q&A right after his uh, lecture, and then we'll do a quick exercise, a uh, 10-minute breakout session exercise, and then we'll regroup. Uh, we'll do a general observation Q&A session, and then the session will end. We're planning to have the session for about one hour. So if you have any questions, please feel free to write in the chat. Uh, Tom will not be able to look at the chat, but I will be able to uh, look at the chat questions and ask Tom or tell Tom to ask the participant to open their um, voice and you know just ask on their own. So uh, if there are no other questions, uh, Tom, please take the stage. Um, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Susanna. Um, I, I feel very welcomed and privileged to uh, uh, join this, this session of yours. But first of all, I wanna thank the uh, Mongolian Evaluation Association uh, for this opp uh, opportunity. And then I also want to recognize and thank uh, Shimji and Susanna and uh, Oyuna um, for working with me. Um, I had a great chance to speak with Susanna and Oyuna at the last American Evaluation Association uh, conference, and we had a very good time. And we did a lot of laughing, and we did we learned a lot, and so forth. So again, I want to th uh, thank uh, you for inviting me to to do this. It's it really is a an, an honor. Um, I was going to ask uh, some questions. Uh, and I don't know, maybe uh, Susanna, you can just give yeah. me a, an understanding. I just want to know how many of you, first of all, uh, Sam Beg Benyanu. I hope I pronounced Sam Beno. 
Sam Beno. Yes, oh, yeah. Sam Beno. Uh, <laughs> very close, Tom. Yeah. That, oh, that very counts. close. <laughs> I, I'm, 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 I'm getting there. Um, how many of you are practitioners? We have one like. Um, I don't see the colleagues, so I have two, two people reacting. How many of you are academics? We have one person from academics, Muftuya. I think Batishik is also an academic. Yeah. Okay, how many are new evaluators or students learning about this thing called evaluation? I think we're feeling a little shy tonight, so. Yeah, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, one like Biamsuran, new evaluator. Uh huh. Fiona. Tom, why don't I ask um, before you start with your presentation? I see this uh, beautiful giraffe on the screen. So, <laughs> why don't you please explain to us um, who this giraffe is and how you came about um, talking about evaluative thinking with your giraffe? I don't really know the true answer to this, <laughs> but I know I was going to be talking with all of you from the uh, Your Evaluation Association. And then when I thought about evaluative thinking, I went way back, maybe about three or four years ago. And I, when I was uh, teaching, um, here at the University of Illinois, um, a class on evaluation society. This word evaluative thinking came up. The word evaluative um, uh, uh, inquiry came up, came up. A lot of evaluative things came up. So I wondered, do giraffes think? And do they think evaluatively? And then when I, I actually, um, use the AI, artificial intelligence, to help me make these uh, little uh, characters of, uh, of giraffes. But as you can see, this giraffe is really thinking. And uh, you can see the wheels and the question marks and the light bulbs and, and so forth. This giraffe is evaluative thinking and, and wants to talk with all of us. So let's begin. Whoops. Um, here's a mama giraffe and a baby giraffe. And the baby is saying, hey, uh, mama, are, are we evaluators? And the mama says, yes, my dear little one, we are evaluators. We are unique. We have long necks, which give us perspective. Our necks allow us to see far and wide. And we can see the larger picture, the highest standards or goals of a program. We strive, my little baby, for excellence and we don't settle for what is easily reachable. And our long legs and steps show measured progress. Our steps are deliberate and well thought out. And we are careful and calculated, ensuring that every step is purposeful and leads toward a clear goal. And since we have a gentle nature and approach, we can describe our method, uh, methods to evaluate programs with empathy and respect while being mindful of everyone involved, all the participants and the administrators and the funding agencies. And we have a unique pattern of spots, which allows us to recognize unique trends in the quantitative and qualitative data that we collect during, evaluate, during the evaluation process. Not only that, we have a keen eye to see subtle but significant details. We also, also recognize the diversity 
of the participants uh, that in the programs that we are evaluating. And our height, our towering height, encourages us to set ambitious targets and benchmarks, aiming to reach new heights in performance and outcomes. All these things allow us to have deeper meaning in, in, in the context of the evaluation and emphasizing perspectives, careful planning, respectfulness, uh, attention to detail and ethical practice. Okay, hey mama, how do we begin an evaluation? Bob Steak, here at the University of Illinois, well known for case studies. He said, we begin with the evaluative thinking. And this allows us to recognize first the question, then the methods. Better first to ask, what do you need to know? Then how to go about finding it? N indeed, evaluative thinking is the core of evaluation. So, little one, let me explain a bit further. I'm going to tell you all about evaluative thinking, the mindset, the key components, why it is essential, the process, and some of the tools and techniques. We will also have an activity, as Susanna uh, mentioned earlier. And after all this, you can ask more questions and we'll have some discussion. So look at that giraffe up there. What's that giraffe doing? He's thinking evaluatively and critical thinking. But before we go into that, I wanna ask you to be thinking about this. What is the meaning of thinking? When we say evaluative thinking, well, what do we mean by thinking? And also, my question is choice. This giraffe is looking around, learning about thinking, and it may, it's going to make choices. So what do you think about choices? Think for about 15 seconds. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the book, Thinking Fast and Slow. It's by Daniel Kahneman. There are two systems in thinking. One is fast thinking and the other is slow thinking. The fast thinking is automatic, it's intuitive and it's quick. Um, it, it relies on instinct and heuristics and it operates without any effort and it can this is uh, the the downside it could lead to biases uh, and and errors for instance right now I am thinking fast and I probably will mispronounce a word or two um, or I'll confuse you or whatever so I'm thinking I'm thinking fast I'm not thinking deep and the other system is slow thinking and that's what evaluative thinking and critical thinking is about. It's deliberate and analytical and rational thinking requires a conscious effort and to understand the complexity of things and complex problems. If I were to ask you, what, who, what is an evaluator? Can you say that quickly? Very difficult, we have to think and we use that system too uh, of uh, slow thinking. Now, choice is something that I learned uh, recently. Um, my wife was, was going to a, a doctor. She's going to have her knees replaced. And she wrote out a huge list of questions. And the, when... when <laughs> My wife kept asking question after question after question. And she was very particular. And she wanted to know a lot of information about this process. 
And then when the doctor looked at me, I said, I don't really have any uh, 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 questions. Um, uh, you know, I can live with what you said and what my, my wife said. Well, there's a book called The Paradox of Choice. And it's a book by Barry Schwartz. And, and when we make choices, like my wife, the, his word was maximizer. And this is to make the best absolute choice that you can. And it, it, it requires particulars. Uh, and it's, it's, it's difficult sometimes for, for a maximizer to quickly say or ask a question to make a choice. So when we make a choice, maximizers will go through all the detail, all the particulars. And in this book, Schwartz says that the maximizer has a difficult time with sometimes stress or anxiety because they want things to be perfect. Now me, when the doctor looked at me, I just said, hey, I, I can live with that. And he calls this choice making uh, as a satisfizer. So I can live with it. Go ahead. And, and I think that's who I am. I make choices you know, easily and, and, and quickly. So I don't experience a lot of anxiety and stress as a satisfizer because I don't want to be critical about some things. So when we make choices, we either, we either go in particulars or we do not. This is very important when we start talking about evaluative thinking and critical thinking. And the giraffe is, I think, a maximizer. Here's a definition of evaluative thinking by uh, some of our colleagues in the field, well-known colleagues, uh, Anne Vo and Tom Archibald. In their uh, seminars and books and so forth, they say evaluative thinking is how we think when we are evaluating. And Ernie House says, indeed, evaluative thinking constitutes the core of cognitive processes. Human thought is fundamentally evaluative. This goes back to uh, that notion of, uh, of thinking fast or thinking slow. And then Jane Davidson, and I really like her uh, quote about understanding what evaluative thinking is. And she says, quantitative evidence is the bones. And qualitative evidence is the flesh. And evaluative reasoning is the vital organ that brings them both to life. A very interesting uh, quote, and it really delves into what evaluators really do. Mixed message, qualitative evidence, um, quantitative evidence, and bringing it all together uh, to make decisions about a particular program or, or project. Now, critical thinking, uh, Michael Scriven and Richard Paul, I don't know if uh, you know who Michael Scriven is, well-known um, founder of evaluation and recently passed uh, away. But he said, critical thinking is the intellectually disciplined process of actively and skillfully conceptualizing, applying, analyzing, synthesizing, and are evaluating information gathered from or generated by observation, experience, reflection, reasoning, or communication as a guide to belief and action. And this is what I call slow thinking. And as an evaluator, when we want to be critical and apply and analyze, we have to think in detail. We have to think, what does that mean? And, and how are we going to get information? What does reflection mean? And so forth. This is deep thinking for an evaluator. It's critical thinking. Okay, this giraffe is wondering, hey, what's the overlap between critical thinking and evaluative thinking? 
I really like this giraffe because sometimes that's where I am, right in the middle. <laughs> sometimes the questions that are asked or the questions that I ask, I go, is this evaluative or is this critical? So it involves questioning and examining beliefs and arguments and evidence to form a well-reasoned judgment or a solution while being open to new information and perspectives and avoiding biases or logical fallacies. Now, Michael Patton, he says, learning how to think evaluatively is learning how to learn and think critically. Rigorous evaluative thinking combines critical thinking, creative thinking, inferential thinking, and practical thinking. I have difficulty really synthesizing uh, Michael Patton's quote, but I think it's spot on. I have to analyze that with, you know, a, a deep uh, thinking. And then Schwant just sim simply says, evaluative thinking requires critical thinking. And Michael Scriven says, hey, critical thinking requires evaluative thinking. So key aspects of evaluative thinking, questioning and curiosity. And this involves continuously asking questions. When we are evaluators, we need to know who are we going, who is this program intended for? Why is this program there? Why is somebody funding it? What is going to be done and when and how? So questioning and curiosity of critical. Then we have evaluative thinking relies on evidential information to make judgment. When I hear the word evidential information, I'm thinking of quantitative and qualitative information or a, a mix. And this includes collecting data, analyzing it and using that information to draw conclusions, to make choices about the value, merit or significance of a program or a policy or an object uh, and so forth. And a systematic approach. Evaluative thinking involves a systematic approach to understanding the complexity of a program, the culture and the background and gathering information and, and analyzing it and, and using it to make uh, judgments. And reflective pra uh, practice. Evaluative thinking encourages reflection on practices, on our decisions that we, and our choices that we make and the particular outcomes, whether they're intended outcomes or not and decision-making. It aids in making informed decisions by providing a framework for assessing the implications and potential fallouts or consequences of different choices. When we think slow or fast, when we make a choice, looking for all the particulars and the details, or we just say, I can live with that, and this choice making, when you make a choice, are you really thinking about the fallout when you make that choice? Are you really thinking the consequences? If what you're evaluating a program and you make a choice to change, say the methodology, or you make a choice to ask the uh, person who is funding this program about, you know, do you like what it is or should you just quit it? And, and the consequences, if you say, let's just quit it. And then the funding agency, and they say, well, we're going to quit it because it doesn't meet our goals in our, in our government or the policies or the legislation. So decision-making in evaluative uh, thinking is very important and continuous uh, improvement. Uh, it, it, uh, continuous improvement goes on all the time. Uh, every time we say something or do something or work with something, we are thinking and it's a continuous improvement. We learn from our mistakes and so forth. And so we make adjustments and enhance the effectiveness of programs and strategies. And stakeholder involvement. 
in my experience, the stakeholder involvement, the key participants in the program, and the, the individuals who are boundary partners, a, a boundary partner, which, say we have a program, the people within the program, uh, the people who are providing the services, who gather the, the uh, they use the resources and do these activities, they are our key, the participants, the teachers, or, or whatever. Now the boundary partners are those outside of that program. The, who funds you? The government funds you? The state funds you? In your school district, for instance, are they uh, uh, taking um, the, uh, money from the from the 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 state aid, the state that gives them an appropriation for a particular amount of money? They're outside of that program. The parents, the community members, they are outside of that program. But it's important to recognize who the key stakeholders are and these boundary partners are when you conduct the evaluation. Why multiple perspectives, multiple understandings, multiple choices, thinking fast, thinking slow. And that is so critical. So these aspects of evaluative thinking, like, like we were talking about, are applied in various contexts, educational, nonprofit, organizations, businesses, governmental agencies, or policies. And it's a valuable skill set for leaders or managers or educators or anyone, anyone that's planning or implementing or assessing projects or programs in terms of uh, merit or significance. I want to share with you something that I did that I learned from my very first evaluation experience. And I can guarantee you that I didn't think of any of these aspects of evaluative thinking. My very first job after I graduated uh, from here at the University of Illinois, <clears throat> I got a job at the Illinois State Board of Education. I was in the evaluation unit and I was charged to conduct my first evaluation of a program in a juvenile detention facility. It was a prison north uh, in Chicago. I went in there feeling proud and great, and I did a portrayal. It's kind of like a case study. I went in there and I just sat down took out my pad, pencil, and just wrote what I saw. I saw these young juveniles imprisoned. They were just sitting, attention, in their desks, nothing on the desks, nothing on the walls. They were all concrete blocks. The, the teacher was one of the, the guards sitting at the desk, not doing anything, not asking questions. And I wrote this portrayal up, a beautiful portrayal. And I thought it was wonderful. And I gave it to my boss. And wow, I got into trouble. I got into trouble. The money was coming from the federal government under legislation called Title I, the money was supposed to be used for uh, uh, reading and writing skills. The Department of Corrections, the State Board of Education were working together. The prison system, the, the guards or the superintendent or whatever, they were the boundary partners. But what I didn't realize at first was that the government, with this legislation of Title I, they wanted fidelity of the program. They were not interested in improving the program. They were not interested at all uh, on, on outcomes. All they wanted to know is, we're giving you the money. What are you doing? What kind of, you know, are you following the proposal? Um, what did you do, you know, with the projector? 
Was it stored away afterwards? We gave you money. So this notion of fidelity did not take into consideration other aspects of evaluation. Remember, first the question, I never asked the question. I went in there with the methods. That was the beginning of my mistake. I didn't ask, you know, were program resources used as intended? I should have, because that would have gotten back to the fidelity. I would have been understanding that. Was the program implemented as proposed? How many individuals, the incarcerated juveniles were served? So in the, did I understand the context? No. So I really did not focus in on the, these different aspects of uh, evaluative thinking. Now, the mama giraffe looks at the baby giraffe and says, hey, little one, are you listening? Do you have any questions? So Susanna, I'm hoping you look at the ch chat box and ask the participants if they are listening <laughs> and if they have any questions or comments. Um, we don't have any questions in the chat yet, but I wanna encourage everyone to feel free to ask, you know, any clarifying, okay, we have a comment saying, yes, listening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they are listening. <laughs> yes. Well, give um, me some. May I ask a question? Short question. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, what year was that? And uh, uh, what was the con evaluation context of the? Uh, United States back then. The, in, on the program I just uh, talked about? Yeah, yeah, your first evaluation. Th that was in 1974. 1974, a different era. The, the uh, It was a difficult, uh, it, was, it was different. Many, uh, of the programs that were funded were by the federal government or by the state, you know, the different departments, whether, you know, like the Department of Corrections and uh, uh, probation and so forth. And they really were giving the money and really it was always, and I don't, I don't wanna say always, but it was the notion of fidelity. You know, what are you doing with the funds? Um, they very seldom said uh, or asked about we would like to improve these programs and we would like you to go in and talk with the participants and talk with the various boundary partners and, and get information on how the program might be improved. And th that really didn't take place way back then. Now today, I believe not here in the United States of America, we avoid this notion of m and &E, monitoring and evaluation but we're learning to recognize the importance of it. But I, I, I don't, of all the sessions that I attended at the American Evaluation Association, I don't think I ever heard or attended a session on m and &E. But my understanding is um, that monitoring is an ongoing process. And, and with Patton, he talks about developmental evaluation. So in my mind, monitoring means working with the program people, as well as with the boundary partners and so forth, um, and, and seeing how things are going. And I think it's, it's continuous and so forth. Now, evaluation, I think is more specific. It's not really monitoring, it's really looking at what's going on uh, and it's answering that question, the, that first question. And then it's deciding on the, the methodologies and data collection and so forth. It was a great question, very good question. Any more questions? Give me some feedback. Uh, can I, uh, hello everyone. So actually I'm listening. So I <laughs> want to make sure it's uh, listening. So I just would like to, the, there is uh, one movie about the, uh, the one bank here. Uh, went to the 
prison and then uh, he established a library and he did a lot of nice uh, recreational development activities and then at the end of the movie this uh, head of the prison just you know uh, killed himself and it, this was this movie was actually quite a good movie then I that time I was wondering why this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, the actually you say in the fidelity this type of issues went so far you know until the died one person you know one or several people even it it looked like very easy to kill someone uh you know there was so uh that was that this movie uh, reminded me of actually a lot of question asked uh, raised a lot of question why this uh, prisons don't have any the monitoring or any type of this uh, evolution you know like why this head of the prison is uh, doing whatever he wants to do you know is that the time you're doing this evaluation or you know i guess uh, this uh, your the your this uh, evaluation period kind me reminded maybe this is the time uh, yeah. no uh, <laughs> what i described a minute ago was a long time ago i okay. have changed considerably uh, we'll we'll be talking about that a little bit. I think your your question is very very important, and that has to do with change and transformation. You know, when I <clears throat> first learning, when I was a student, the what I learned simply was methodologies, and all my teachers, really, all my teachers were white males. I mean, and we our evaluation. Uh, was typically what you just somewhat described. It was fidelity, but over the over time, I learned about methodologies and quantitative and qualitative analysis and so forth. Um, it, it was a it, it, this was a gradual process and it was a learning process. But okay. thank you. I, I'm going to continue here and develop. Uh, this giraffe is trying to develop a mindset. An evaluative thinking mindset. So, Jim G, you have another evaluator there. <laughs> yes, my shadow evaluator. <laughs> okay, this uh, evaluative thinking mindset is interesting. And these are the things that are very difficult to think in terms of thinking slow and understanding the true meaning and, and what's going on. And this takes a lot of practice, but embracing curiosity and having an open mind is very important if we're going to think evaluatively. We have to embrace uh, curiosity. We need to have an open mind. We need to be self-aware. Who are we? What are our values? What are our biases? And you know, what kind of practical wisdom do we have? If we think about these things, values and biases, then we will perhaps recognize those in the people that we're working with or the program people or the staff, like I was saying, the Department of Corrections and the State Board of Education, their interest was very narrow and they had a bias. It was legislation. I'm not sure that all legislation you know, is unbiased, but it is biased. And, the, and it has a different value system because it's made up from a lot of different folks. And then developing critical thinking skills. We just talked about those a little while ago where Scrib and this, uh, uh, define them and questioning things. When we question, we are actually doing evaluative uh, thinking, part of our mindset. You know, what is the primary focus uh, or question that you would like uh, to focus on during this evaluation. Um, are we doing things correctly? Uh, I don't know. Do you think you have enough resources or, or whatever? And practice reflective thinking, very, very important. Um, Susanna, remind me of time. We are quite short on time. So I would like to speed up a little bit if you can, because we may okay. not have time for a breakout session. So. Okay. We have to learn from mistakes and feedback, contain, uh, engage in continuous learn, uh, learning, 
force of decision-making skills, embrace complexity, transformation, complexity, systems, embrace failure, very important. Um, embrace it and we will learn from our failures. Collaboration, listen for understanding. On the bottom of my computer, I have a little note and it says, Tom, listen, listen, listen. And Tom, your goal is to understand. That's a, I have it there because I have problems with that. Empathy is very important and share your insights. Willingness to learn from your experiences acting uh, in regard to this, this mindset. Okay, why is it essential? Because it's the starting point for conducting an evaluation. It defines the purpose and scope of the evaluation. It helps organizations and individuals make informed decisions based on evidence rather than on assumptions. It supports accountability by demonstrating the impact and value of programs and actions. It forces learning and continuous improvement by identifying strengths and areas for development. This giraffe is teaching all these students why evaluative thinking is essential. It enhances transparency and trust among stakeholders. When I talked about the program at the prison system, transparency and trust with speaking truth to power, I made a huge mistake, but I, I learned from that. I didn't understand what speaking truth to power meant. This is the process. I, I will go quickly through this because this is what we normally do in the sense of conducting evaluations, but we have to think clearly. Define the purpose and scope. We collect data, we analyze it, we interpret it, we make judgments, we communicate findings, and we use those findings. This process is very important for understanding when we conduct evaluations. In each section, we have to think evaluatively. And then let's look at some tools. This is fun. <laughs> SWOT analysis. And I, I'm, I'm, I would imagine that most of you know what SWOT ana uh, analysis is. It's a tool that evaluates the strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats related to making a decision or a project. Now this giraffe is looking for feedback. And this is actively seeking and utilizing feedback to provide new perspectives and understandings and insights. Very important feedback. You learn about yourself, about what you're doing that is appreciative and, and that which you need to make corrections. Case studies. Case studies are fun. I had a lot of fun in that prison system doing the portrayal. <laughs> I learned a lot about it. Mindfulness and emotional intelligence. This is being aware of your own values and biases and so forth. It's an emotional intelligence. Um, when you walk or you meet somebody, you're looking at me, you have emotions. And if they're angry emotions or this guy doesn't know what the heck he's talking about, how can you control those emotions when you're doing evaluation? Then you have mind mapping. And I would imagine that many of you have been in a, a program or you're working together or you're on the board or like in, in the association, um, it, you, there's an issue or a problem and, and uh, you, you do mind mapping where everybody is involved to you know, give their thoughts. I hope you don't hear that, that my phone. Sorry, we have about 10 minutes until the hour. Okay, critical thinking. critical thinking, peer review and reflective practice. We talked about all these. These giraffes are good evaluators. Okay. Great. Thank you so here's, much, Tom. Yeah, yeah. Here's the question in the in the in the group in the groups that you're going to put. Uh, you are an evaluator, and you were asked to evaluate this classroom for accountability to governmental funding agency. The government gave you money. They want accountability, and you 
were asked to evaluate this classroom. So think evaluatively, critically, what questions might you ask during the evaluation process? Um, I would like to suggest to make the exercise for five minutes. So five okay. minutes for the breakout sessions, and then we regroup and then spend about five minutes. One person from each group discusses, sort of summarizes their discussions per breakout group. And then we do a quick Q&A observations after and close the session. What do you think, Tom and Chimge? Excellent. Great. Yes, so I will uh, break the, I will create three breakout rooms. So maybe five to six people in each group and we'll convene back in five minutes. So I visited every virtual room. They uh, were having very heated discussions. So <laughs> I urged everyone to come back to the main room. <laughs> We are in the main room now? Yes, we are in the main I room. I see. Okay. okay. Group three is coming back. Uh -huh. I have okay. one question meanwhile, Tom. So you, you mentioned that you used AI uh, create, to create these giraffes, right? I really okay. like the giraffes. <laughs> so I was wondering if you maybe could share later uh, how the, some tools that you create. It looks like you give some content and then these giraffes are created, right? I had to do some uh, deep uh, <laughs> thinking to do this. Okay. Um, yeah. Many, uh, about a year ago, I did a, a presentation. I'm taking French. And so I had to make a presentation in French and it was about the Kugelin Islands uh, mm -hmm. in the South Pole. And so I thought, wow, how can I get to the South Pole or what do I know is going down in the South Pole? So that's when I thought of a giraffe, mm -hmm. tall neck and I had a bird on top that could see all the way down there and give me information. So that's how I came up with the notion of, of giraffe. With using artificial intelligence, all I did was I have the what they call the uh, chat GPT-4, and it allows you to make images. So what mm -hmm. I said, um, hello, my name is Tom. I want you to make an image of a giraffe who is thinking. Mm -hmm. Wow. And wow, I hit it, boom, and the giraffe came up. If I didn't like the picture, I said, could you do another image, please? Mm -hmm. And then I got that one. I said, would you mind making it simpler? Boom. Mm -hmm. So that's how I use the uh, AI. And it was really, it was fun, actually, really fun. And I, I actually used it to give me a, an understanding about what do we mean by critical thinking? And I looked on my one of my books back there from Scriven, and I saw what he wrote that and so artificial intelligence, guess what it did? It quoted word for word from Scriven. Hmm. And, and so it was amazing. And I think evaluators today can use AI uh, productively in their work. It'll also um, analyze your data, your quantitative data, uh, not so much qualitative information, but I can just say that whatever you get, you really need to look at it carefully because it may not be accurate and so forth. Yeah. Um, in, the, in last year's uh, AEA, we had a, at least three or four sessions on AI. Um, David Fetterman gave a good presentation on AI and how he is using it uh, as well. Other questions? Susanna? Yeah. Sorry for our delay. We had a very engaging discussion. Uh -huh. <laughs> the participants uh, in uh, my group were also people who, well, myself, I'm former government uh, officer in Civil Girls as well. And we had another colleague who's currently in the ME department in the government. So, and also a former a colleague of mine. So we had a longer chat. But um, I want to be conscious of time. Tom, have you regrouped? from the breakout sessions. Yeah. Uh, we're you... a little over time. You're done? No, I'm not done. Okay. I can, um, I can stay 
for the next five hours. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I think our participants may have well, a lunch, Tom, okay. not us. <laughs> okay. so, not I'm, retired. <laughs> I'm retired. <laughs> yeah. So why don't we maybe spend like um, one, one or two minutes per person who can represent the breakout session. And I want to ask uh, Ms. Tilian Giddish from my group to if she can maybe start off and then we can have other group members uh, for, spend like one minute or two minutes just summarizing their discussion. Tilian Giddish, over to you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for a nice presentation. And then we are just talking about the how is the monitoring and the evaluation going on currently in our government. And uh, a month ago, I left my job, but I hosted the last uh, 10 months work, work as a head of the monitoring and evaluation department. That time, currently, our government is uh, gauging the data from the all organization, and then we are preparing monitoring reports. All evaluation is done by the uh, donors and international organizations, and then we was planned to uh, change the, our uh, guidelines regarding for the monitoring and evaluation. In that time, we are thinking about you know regarding for the program evaluation. It will be uh, done by the uh, government itself. Also, it's possible to done by the uh, joint evaluation or some other organizations we was thinking about. We was planning to put in our guidelines. And thank you, Susan. Thank you. Um, and I also want to mention too, um, as she mentioned just now, she was part of the government established a, a new sort of SOE, um, state um, entity, which sole purpose was to basically do evaluations. And this was separate from the cabinet secretariat, which used to be the primary entity before the establishment of, of this organization. So it's played a crucial role in ensuring, you know, uh, independent evaluation. So the capacity is still building, but, you know, um, we're on the way to improving. So I want to invite um, someone else from the other groups. Um, please feel free to open your mic in one yeah. or two minutes. Uh, I think just from our group, this uh, uh, moderator has just uh, suggested me to explain the discussion of our group. So uh, I hope I'm audible to all of you. Yes, we can hear you, but your voice is shaking a little bit. Um, maybe if you try not to move as much yeah now i'm just talking without this headphone wireless headphone so mm -hmm. uh okay from our group uh, we were uh, we were seven person in group so i think uh all group discuss on the photo particularly the photo uh of the classroom photo so we have i'm quite happy that uh, uh i think out of seven, just four person just put their ideas on just the uh, assessing the uh, photo based on the evaluation, evaluative thinking. So the discussion was around the uh, how equitable participation is in the classroom. And uh, was there equitable and is there justice? Uh, and then we found a little bit, not very much, uh, because the taller are standing in the front benches and the smaller are just sitting in the back benches. So that's not a just equitable, just classroom, uh, just uh, environment. And in that context, the teaching, I mean, just teaching is not just reaching or not just, um, just understanding or participating by all equally. That is one aspect. Another, uh, just our participants just uh, put their uh, put ideas around how contextual is the you know context or the teaching because that's education sector. 
teaching learning process. So was the context, was the content, was the, you know, just intervention, the contextual to the policy or the need of the participants. So that is questionable. So on the other hand, just uh, there is discussion around accountability, you know, mm-hmm. accountability of the government, accountability towards the, you know, uh, just uh, funding, just donors. So that's not clear enough from the, the one aspect of evaluation methodology because there is there is photo and the one methodology is not adequate to evaluate the you know this intervention. So this is all what I just remember because I didn't take the note. So if there are some more from our this group members, uh, I would really appreciate. Thank you so much, um, and for your very succinct summary. Um, before going to Tom, I want to ask the other group. I think we had three groups, right? Can we, okay. Um, we have one group member left. Um, can the member from the third group please speak up and summarize your discussions? And then we'll go back to Tom. Um, so maybe, um, uh, are you hearing? Is it okay? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe the, we actually with the our group, the three of us, uh, we didn't go so far. Like um, we just trying to uh, struggle what kind of questions actually about asking this, um, try to understand the questions. But uh, basically, we just uh, try, started uh, to look at the observ- from the observation of this picture, giraffes, and so what we observe within. In the classroom, it looks like there are different type of students, like different uniforms, and mm. as in terms of size, tall and small. And so, we just thought maybe we have to start question from the diversity, like uh, whether this uh, program is uh, uh, this uh, fit this needs of this diverse group of students. Uh, also, the, whether this classroom is a fit for this uh, classroom environment, as a fit for the diverse group's needs, or. So, Content of the classes, uh, uh, class uh, content of the program is uh, um, enough, you know, to meet this um, needs of diverse students. This type of question may we may need to ask first, and then maybe uh, the question might be the have to ask from the two sides whether the students or the stakeholders they are accountable to uh, or they. Uh, Accountable or whether they are uh, allowed to participate in the evaluation, or from the other side, whether the uh, uh, spenders of the funding whether they allow the students to participate in evaluation. Basically, they we have to combine issue of the accountability with the participation. So maybe this type of question, we just the end of this discussion, we came to this type of <laughs> uh, conclusion. Mm-hmm. So maybe if I missed something, maybe Simon. You can from Austria. She's she's from Austria. She said so. She can add here. Thank you. Great, thank you, Patrick. Um, all right, Tom. There you go. Three groups discussions. What do you think? You're mute. Okay, perfect. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I really. Uh, uh, feel good and appreciate all the participation and your comments. I think we're, uh, what we would say are spot on was really, really uh, good. I found <clears throat> um, this session fun. Uh, actually, I was thinking about what I was saying and what I was doing and then what I'd be reading uh, and uh, you know, off the, the slide or, or whatever. Um, I really, I, I enjoyed it. And I want to thank all of you so very, very much. When when I ask for feedback, I just always remember it's important to ask for feedback so that you can learn when you're, when you're doing your evaluation and evaluative thinking. You need people to give you feedback so that you can make adjustments and understand. Um, and that means you have to be open and you have to understand your biases and so forth. I, I know when on uh, when I served as president on the AEA, um, I I wasn't thinking. I, I was doing uh, quick thinking, 
about you, Tom, you're the president and here are 12 board members. And I never thought about, they all think differently. They all come from various backgrounds and they have tremendous experience. And so when I would set the agenda, I was not really thinking clearly. And then it was, it was very diverse and it made me think about my own biases. Every one of us has biases. And I need, made me think about my own values and where did them values come from? So those are the things that I learned when I was putting this um, the session together. Very, uh, very important to uh, uh, do those kinds of things. So this was, this was fun uh, for me. I learned a lot. And the only thing I wish you would have done is giving me some feedback and telling me, hey, you're not saying the right things <laughs> no, no, no. Or, or, or whatever. Um, I have one other thing to say and correct me, please. Shin Oni Min Hojie. Wow, that's right. Happy New Year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Merry Christmas. So actually yeah. in two days you will have Christmas, isn't it? Two or three uh -huh. days. Yeah. Yes, Christmas. yes. Merry Christmas. And we're getting ready to where we live uh, in Champaign Urbana, the University of Illinois. It's in the middle of Illinois. And tomorrow, my wife and I were driving up to see our daughter and grandkids in Chicago. We'll mm -hmm. spend two days. Then we'll get in the car and drive out to Kansas City, which is mm -hmm. about a five hour drive for the other daughter and grandkids and great grandkids. I have four great Oh, one was born yesterday. Five great grandkids. Wow. <laughs> so, anyway, nice. mm -hmm. thank you so very, very, very much. I uh, I had fun, and 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 thank uh, you all. Uh, just wonderful uh, for inviting me, Oyuna, Shimji, and Susanna. I can say Susanna <laughs> uh, as well. So, thank you very, very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you, yeah. everyone, for uh, making time and participating. And it's been a yeah, pleasure yeah. to talk to you, Tom. <laughs> Just You're always welcome back, yeah. in Mongolia. Yeah. yeah. And Thank you very India. much. Thank you so Thank much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Have a nice day. Have a good night. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. Okay.